Hello to all you unconventional conventionists. Welcome to Rocky Talkie, a Rocky Horror podcast where we give you the down and dirty on all things meatloaf, recipes, flavors, ovens, and more. I'm Jacob. I'm Aaron. And I'm Nikki. What did y'all do this week? Well, I was born, so that's a pretty swag thing that I participated in. Happy birthday, Nikki. Happy birthday. Thank you, guys. Maybe ask what I did for my birthday. What did you do for your birthday? Oh, my God. (laughs) I'm so glad you asked. I'm, I'm just really pumped that you asked. I actually surprisingly had a pretty decent birthday. I... I have learned that with aging comes not looking forward to your birthday anymore. Uh, That's like a new thing that I'm coming to terms with. Um, So I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Because it's just like, you know, like I don't want any presents. And I'm not like, I can't go to the local party and play anymore and get in a ball pit without getting I mean, in trouble. Yeah, so, you can. Yeah, you'll just, get arrested. Just some repercussions. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, my best friend and I drove up to go get his girlfriend from Albany. So we drove three and a half hours there and back just to pick her up. And then they slept at my house. And the next day, me and a bunch of my friends from cast all went up to Philadelphia and we went to Terror Behind the Walls. It's not Terror Behind the Walls anymore. It's the Eastern State Penitentiary. They do like a beer garden with like a couple haunted houses. But it was really vibey and really fun. So if you're not like really big into horror, like I'm such a chicken shit. I don't do well with haunted houses. It was nice because there was like a some scary, but there was also like just like chill vibes. We ate French toast and they had French toast beer. It was exciting. I can get behind that. But then we drove... Home from Philadelphia for another hour and a half. And then the next day we drove another six and a half hours to drive Amanda back to Albany and drive back home. So it was a lot of driving, but I love traveling. So I don't know. It was just like a good Nikki birthday. Like it was very on brand for me. I enjoyed it. Right on. That sounds really fun. And none of my co-hosts said happy birthday to me. I uh Let's unpack that right now, I think right here. We, we Let's both talk about said it. happy birthday to you. I'm pretty sure Meg said happy birthday to you before the recording. No, Meg said happy birthday to me on my birthday, but none of you did. Oh. Nikki, I made yes, you a Aaron. graphic on your birthday. Yeah, actually, you're right, Aaron. You did. So, Aaron, you get a pass. Jacob, let's talk about it. Um, I said happy birthday through my girlfriend who said happy birthday to you, I'm sure, <laughs> multiple Andrea times. never said happy birthday. She actually just said birth, to which I said yes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was the RTH of that birth Yes, text, Jacob, so I do. I, I did have your vibes, like the TH in the birth. I was like, yeah, right? I think Jacob might have typed that. So I apologize. I overreacted. That was on me. Hey, it's all right. It's We all make mistakes, you know? Yeah, I'm really sorry. How was your week? I hope I didn't make it any worse. Um, my week was great, but there's one thing I want to talk about. So I live in a college dorm with a bunch of undergraduate freshmen. And my girlfriend was over here this past weekend, and the both of us got into an elevator. And as it was going down, it filled up with people, as elevators tend to do. But they were all tiny. My girlfriend's a little bit tall. She's like, I want to say 5'8", and I'm like 6 foot. Andrea's not 5'8". <laughs> well, she's some height that's <laughs> close to mine. I don't know. At everyone who got on that elevator, there was no way bigger than like 5'4". And they were all like these tiny women. And as we were going down, I turned to her and was like, everyone in this elevator is so much tinier than us. And she turned and like had this weird look on her face looking at me like she didn't know what I was talking about. And then she looked out at all the people in the elevator and started bursting with fucking laughter. And everyone (laughs) turned to look at us. And I felt like Willy Wonka and all the Oompa Loompas were just waiting for me to tell them what to do. So that was that was fun. That was like one of the highlights of my weekend. One hundred percent. Aaron, how about you? Wow. I, I just need a moment on that one. So, so you both learned about what it's like, you know, not being children anymore this week. It sounds like that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. My week was awesome. Um, what did I do? Uh, oh, uh, just this last weekend, I went to this awesome party that was super fun. Uh, it was at a club. And uh, I learned a little bit about... <sighs> How I live in the Rocky Horror bubble. So one of the uh, entertainment things that was going on at this was uh, a bunch of 
uh, like circus sideshow acts. Super cool. I love circus sideshow acts. Like that's always really fun. And they did a bunch of really cool different stuff, you know, like smashing a cinder block while on a bed of nails or like, you know, sword swallowing and stuff. Really cool. Uh, but when they came out with a staple gun and, and stapled a ribbon to this guy's face, the whole audience was kind of like, oh, about it. But I was just kind of sitting here and I turned to Megan and I go, you know, isn't that exactly what Jack used to do as a pre-show at our show? She was just like, yeah, 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 we've seen, are we going to the bar? <laughs> like, it was, it was, it was one of those moments where I was just like, huh, all right, I guess, I guess I'm a little jaded on this one. It's a great show, super fun, super fun night, uh, but, uh, you know, a little reminder that, uh, we all live in the Rocky Horror Bubble. Um, someone used to staple a ribbon to their head as a pre-show? Well, he, he'd do, like, blockhead stuff. Cyclone Jack Sullivan, awesome guy. He was on the New York City cast for a number of years. Uh, he does a bunch of different sideshow stuff. One of them is human blockhead, uh, you know, hammering nails into his face or, or stapling stuff, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he, he would sometimes do it as a pre-show or as a warm-up for the audience and uh, got a lot of reactions. Uh, but, uh, you know, needless to say, I've seen it a few times. That is that is incredible. Yeah, not to flex or anything, but Jack Sullivan and I are actually Facebook friends. Um, <gasps> so bow down. What? Yeah, oh me and me Cyclone and Cyclone Jack, Jack Sullivan, Sullivan are are tight, tight Holy as two peas shit. in a pod. Yep, I've liked some of his posts. Yes, I oh, have. No way. Does he have me unfollowed? Most likely, but you know what? Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, let's start with our first segment. First and foremost in global news today, we'd like to give a special nod to Michael Leade, better known as Meatloaf. This past Monday, September 27th, was his birthday. He's my Libra brother. He's my Libra brother. He's my Libra brother. We're gonna fall in love. Thank you. That's from... Dora, I'm pretty sure that soundtrack, nice. No, that's from Blue's Clues, but thanks. Oh, that very yeah. similar programs. All right. Fans of Meatloaf will be pleased to know a quick Google search of the term birthday meatloaf returns a plethora of images and recipes for birthday cake meatloaf, a horrendous design of layered meatloaf slices topped with mashed potato icing and served to unsuspecting naughty children. On the off chance you're interested in more than the recipe Food Network calls rather kooky for a cake, here are some birthday facts about our boy Meat. Born on the 27th day of the ninth month in the year 1947, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, Mr. Loaf is a Libra, as Nikki just told you. Unlike a lot of his contemporaries, David Bowie, Freddie Mercury, and former lead singer of Foreigner, Lou Graham, Meatloaf is in fact still alive. Though you might not know for sure just by looking at him. Yikes! His uh, I'd Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That song won both the Best Solo Rock Vocal Grammy and the NME Award for Worst Single in 1994. He also won the International Best Male Solo Artist at the Brit Awards in 94 and 96, as well as the Danish Music Award for International Album of the Year in 1994. 1994 sounds like a good year for me. In the past couple of years, Meatloaf has sustained injuries on tour, most recently breaking his collarbone at the Texas Frightmare Halloween convention in 2019, but we are happy to announce that as of now, he's healthy, back on his feet, and currently touring across the United States and Canada. We here at Rocky Talkie love the loaf and we wish him the best on tour and in all his future endeavors. Happy 74th, Meat! Yay! <laughs> Next up in global news, we have a pretty rare announcement. On November 13th, GalaxyCon will be hosting a virtual Rocky Horror meet and greet where you can see all your favorites, including Barry, Little Nell, and Patricia Quinn. Uh, Jacob, I know you're not here every week, but you must know we make GalaxyCon announcements all the time. Why is this one so special? Well, this time around, you can also see the man, the myth, the legend, Tim Curry will also be in attendance. Uh, it says here in the script, Aaron creams his pants. Oh! Uh. Nikki gasps. Huh. <sighs> Meg faints. Aaron, you should probably go check on her real quick. 
Uh, and Jacob doesn't know who that is. So for those of you, like Jacob, who might be a little bit out of the loop, GalaxyCon organizes conventions of all shapes and sizes across the United States. This is only the most recent Rocky event that they've organized, and they do include them as part of their lineups pretty often. They've had Barry, Little Nell, and Patricia Quinn at various cons on digital interviews and Q&As. They've even had Meatloaf on a live Q&A sesh in one of the few Rocky Horror events we've seen him do. This time around, there will be two sets of online meet and greets. At 2 p.m., fans can have a live video meet and greet with Tim. And at 5 p.m., there will be a live Q&A with Barry, Nell, and Pat. Then, just one hour later, at 6 o'clock, personal video chat sessions will begin with all three of those guys. In addition to the meet and greets, you can send in your own items to be signed by Barry, Nell, or Patricia. Or you can have your items signed by a pair, Barry and Tim, Barry and Pat, or Barry and Nell. Looks like my bear bear gets around. We know, we know, it's what you love about him. You can also order pre-signed items, including an It Funko Pop signed by Tim, Brad Tidy Whities signed by Barry, or Nell, Pat, and Barry are all selling signed photos of Brad, Columbia, and Magenta, plus everybody is selling signed Rocky posters. You can see the prices for everything, as well as this and other upcoming events, all on the GalaxyCon website, galaxycon.com, which we'll have linked for you in our show notes. And of course, if you attend, be sure to write to us and tell us all about it. Now, as a fun little transition between global and community news this week, we've got something special for our listeners. A little pre-Halloween treat, if you will. On September 26, 1975, the Rocky Horror Picture Show opened at the UA Westwood in Los Angeles, California. And since the late 80s, the show has been opening every Saturday night at the Newark Theater in West LA with the Sins of the Flesh cast. So to celebrate the 46th anniversary of the Rocky Horror Picture Show opening in Los Angeles, California, we're going to play some Cali Rocky trivia. All right, quiz time! Now, since Aaron literally spends his free time reading Rocky Horror theses, I figure Nikki might need a little help just to keep everything fair and square. So as the official Rocky Talkie game host, I'll be posing every question first to Aaron with three potential answers, and Aaron will submit his choice. Then a different, yet related question will be posed to Nikki with two potential answers. Without further ado, let's get into it! These rules do not sound fair. I'm here for it. You literally write every week a thing about Rocky Horror. Just like a a, a mind thing about Rocky Horror. How could you? Like, it can't be even. That would be unfair. Sins of the Flesh has been around for a long time. There's no doubt about that. But there is some uncertainty as to when exactly Sins came together as a group and started performing. Aaron, when did Sins start performing? November 1987, December 1987, or January 1988? Okay. I might read a lot of Rocky Horror, but boy, I cannot pull dates like this out of my ass. So I have a feeling that I'm just going to look a fool today. Um, well, 87, end of 87, beginning of 88. I don't know. Let's go. Well, I don't think it'd be around Christmas time. That seems like a weird time to start a shadow cast. Let's go January of 1988. All right. Unfortunately, you are wrong. They did start in December 1987. And I'll give you a little bit more info about that after we get the answer from Nikki. So, Nikki, the question to you is, as perhaps Aaron's first question outlines, Rocky Horror people are not known for their record keeping, but we are ones for pomp. On the official Rocky Horror Picture Show fan site, Sins of the Flesh has two cast profiles, One from 1996 and another from 2007. Which of these two profiles, if either, has the starting date of their performances in their text? 
I want to say the one from 2007, because I feel like as time goes on, people become more sentimental. Final answer? I mean, yeah. You're correct! Oh! And uh, the way you phrased it is right, too, because the 96 one is definitely worded much more do not carry with out of thought in the world and all about partying. And the 2007 one is more regimented, and they try to list when exactly their cast started, but even they don't know it, oddly enough, in their cast profile saying, we're not exactly sure when we started sometime around the late 80s. Which is funny because the wiki does know. So, Aaron gets no points. Nikki gets one point. Mm. On to question two. Wait, what's the wiki say? The wiki says uh, December 1987. Oh, go figure. Cool. To Aaron, Callie Rocky Har is amazing. You know, except for the heat and the desert and the fires and the puka shell necklaces. It would be such a shame if Sins was the only Rocky Horror cast to perform in this magical state. So, Aaron, do you know how many casts there are on record as either being in rotation currently at a Cali theater or as having been in rotation at a previous time in California? Is it 20 casts, 28, or 23? The Tiffany Theater, Midnight Madness, Midnight Insanity, Sins of the Flesh, Berkeley's cast, the second Berkeley cast, Indecent Expo- no, Indecent Exposure is the second Berkeley- You know what? I'm not going to sit here and list 20, 23, or 28 of these, so I'm going to go with 28. Unfortunately, it is only 20. Though, in just the few you listed, such as the first Berkeley and the second Berkeley cast, uh, I did not- Count those, I was going by the wiki page for Los Angeles Rocky Horror, which I assumed had all the Los Angeles Rocky Horror uh, shadow cast, but perhaps I was wrong, and there are more than even 20 or 28. Oh, I, I you see, see, I thought you meant all of California, which, like, there's definitely more than 28 that were all of California. Yeah, thinking about that now, uh, the wiki only has 20 listed, but I'm sure there are a lot that they missed. Very cool, Oh, though. it's... Yeah, I'm, I'm very stupid because I'm now realizing the page is just for Los Angeles Rocky Horror, and it's not Cali Rocky Horror at all. So I'm going to give that one to you. That is my bad. And we'll move <laughs> on to the question for Nikki. All right. On to your question, Nikki. Which of the following has the best name of all the Los Angeles Rocky Horror casts? Is it the Denton Affair or the Tiffany Troop? Remember, you're going based off of my name preferences. Okay, so let's let's think about this analytically. We have the Denton Affair and the Tiffany Troop. I feel like you might like the Tiffany Troop because of the alliteration with the T's, but also I think you might prefer the Denton Affair because it has the word affair in it and you would be like, huh, nice infidelity. And also, secondly, it has like a callback to Rocky of Denton. So I'm going to go with the Denton Affair. You're absolutely right. Mm. I think we've mentioned the Denton Affair a few times on this podcast. I don't know how or why, but it just, it like, it's alive in my head, that word. So I liked it. Yeah. Um, I didn't even notice the alliteration on Tiffany Troop. I saw the word Tiffany and I was like, oh, that's a woman word. I don't like it. Just point of order here. Is the Tiffany Troop the uh, Tiffany Theater? Let's find out. That, yes, their cast venue is the Tiffany Theater. Amazing. So the Tiffany Theater is in, well, was, it's not there anymore, but it was in Hollywood. That's about 40 minutes outside of L.A. Well, I guess we can't trust the Rocky Horror Wiki for anything. <laughs> I mean, it counts, right? It's the L.A. Metro. <laughs> sure, sure. All right. So Nikki gets a point. Aaron gets a point. That is one point for Aaron, two points for Nikki. Let's go on down to question number three, our final. All right. For our final cues, we'll be going over the cast motto for Sins, featured in their previously mentioned cast profile from 1996. Aaron, what is the cast motto? This is super specific, and I've never heard of cast mottos before, so if you have no idea, bud, I will give you hints or something. But if you think you can do it on your own, go for it. The Island of Broken Toys. Unfortunately not. Their motto, as listed on their first cast profile from 96, 
is always get in eight good hours a night and try to get some sleep too. It's also the island of misfit toys. I even spoke it wrong. Well, there you go. You lost mm-hmm. two ways. Wow. I'm, a, I'm just, I'm a loser, baby. That's how it is sometimes. And the final question for Nikki. Sins has a Twitter, a Facebook, an Instagram, and a MySpace account, as well as a website associated with them. Two of these are defunct. Which two are they? So defunct means they don't use them anymore, or they mean that means, does that mean you made it up? No, the, they don't use them anymore. They are no longer working. Okay. I'm going to say that definitely the MySpace account. I know that MySpace is still up, so this might be a trick question, but also like if they are using MySpace, I have further questions because what what is their target audience? Um, and I'm also going to say Twitter because I don't really know anything about California's social media preferences, but I know that using Twitter down here on the East Coast like isn't a good marketing strategy. And I feel like Facebook and Instagram has a better ad platform. So I'm going to say that Twitter and MySpace are the defunct social medias. Unfortunately, it is MySpace. You got that one correct. But the other one is not Twitter. Their Twitter is still up. The other one is their website, which is no Mm. longer, you can no longer use it. Okay. Um, Yeah, sad thing about actually all these social medias is they're not really using any of them. Uh, The most recent thing from their Instagram was right at the start of the pandemic. They made a post about, hey, we're not doing stuff anymore. And on their Facebook and their Twitter, they were making posts up until December of last year when they seemed to stop for some unknown reason. So we miss you guys, Sins of the Flesh, and we hope you get back out there soon. Yeah, as far as I know, they're still on hiatus. So back soon, I'm sure, but wishing you the best out there on the West Coast. Yeah. So right now, point totals are... Two to Nikki and one to Aaron. But now we've got a bonus question. Da, 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 da. Lights fade down. Gets really quiet. Ooh, spooky. Whoever can come up with the cast motto Meg likes the most gets an extra point and gets credited when she starts drunkenly telling people at the bar that it's the official NYCRHPS cast motto. Since Meg just added this question into the script as I was reading the segment and I did not come up with it myself, I'll be participating too. First up, Aaron's gonna let us know what he thinks. All right. Uh, I'm gonna go with um, the New York City Rocky Horror cast were the wet spot. All right. The New York City Rocky Horror cast were the wet spot. And now, it's to me. My choice for motto is... NYCRHPS. Our website is better than yours. (laughs) Fuck. I don't have one. Anything, Nikki. Whatever you want. No, I'm really overwhelmed. I don't know. NYCRHPS. I'm really overwhelmed. I don't know. (laughs) All right. I'm really overwhelmed. I don't even know. Those are your three options, Meg. Let us know what you think. Hi, everybody. Oof, these are some good answers, you guys. Well, I gotta say, sweetie, you know me. I do love a good wet spot. And Jacob, I do have a major superiority complex when it comes to our cast. And I do think our website is better than yours and yours and yours and everyone's. But I gotta say, as someone who has been a cast director for, what, like four or five years now? I don't fucking know. The answer I want to give almost anyone, anytime they ask me anything, is definitely, I am so overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to have to give the point to Nikki (laughs) with her answer of, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't know. Because that's my personal motto. All right! Summarizing our point totals from earlier, that looks like it is Nikki with three points, Aaron with one point, and Jacob with four points because he's the game master and is dictating the rules as this is unfolding. Jacob wins! Woohoo! Woohoo! With that over, let's head to community news. I didn't sign up for a game show. 
We need to take a 15 minute break. I'm too overwhelmed. Hello to all you unconventional conventionists. That's right, it is time for an RKO Con 4 update from your 2022 Rocky Horror Picture Show Convention Masters, the RKO Army. And it's coming to you direct from us, the crew, over at the Rocky Talkie Podcast. Yay! Yeah! Yeah! Let's fucking go. This one is super hot and fresh off the presses. Just dropped on Tuesday, September 28th. And boy, are we ready. That's right. Get out those checkbooks because the hotel room block for RKO Con 4 just dropped. And you do not want to miss out on getting your room booked early. Who the fuck has a checkbook? I just ordered a checkbook, but seriously, ain't nobody got time for that shit. And neither do you. And that's why you should book online like a normal fucking person. And guess what? We're all going back to the Hotel Hilton in Providence, Rhode Island. Apparently, the Hotel Hilton couldn't get enough of our Rocky R shenanigans at RKO3 and are ready and waiting to receive us all again, August 3rd through the 7th, 2022, for RKO Con 4. Both single and double rooms are available at the room block rate of 189 bucks per night, plus taxes and fees, of course. Just make sure you're getting the exclusive convention promotional rate by following the link we've dropped below and checking out all the details on the RKOCon 2022 social network group on Facebook. RKO Army is requesting guests who do not need a double bedroom to please book a single in order to allow for those who really do need a double. Don't worry, we've been assured that the room size for singles is just as big as the double bedrooms. And trust us, there's plenty of room to fit all your booze, bags, costumes, props, and friends, and still leave room for when you invite a few new acquaintances to stay for the night. Or maybe a bite. Who the fuck wrote this? I said a bite, not a lick. Book now in order to make sure you're at the center of the action. If you're coming to RKO Con 4, you'll definitely want to get into the con block of rooms, surrounded on all sides by like-minded Rocky Horror fans 24-7. Rest assured that you won't get any pesky interruptions while practicing for bedroom scene at 4 a.m., if you know what I mean. Oh, they know what we mean. RKO is encouraging everyone to book the hotel early so that they can start discussions with the hotel on expanding the block as soon as possible. And don't forget to join the Hilton Honors Program if you're not already a member, as it gives you access to perks like free internet. Who doesn't like free? This is going to be one hell of a con and an absolute blowout nonstop party. Information about con ticket sales will be announced in the near future, so stay tuned for more updates. If you want to check out a draft of the schedule of events for this entire amazing weekend, check out the official RKOCon website at rkocon.com slash events. And if you have any questions, hit up the official RKOCon 2022 social network group on Facebook. So get those rooms booked. The link is group.hilton.com slash v5h6rw or check it out down below. And don't forget to tune into us, the Rocky Talkie Podcast, for all the latest in global and community Rocky Horror news. We're over at RockyTalkiePodcast.com. We'll see you at RKO Con 4. Oh my god, I'm so pumped. Hi, so pumped, I'm John. <sighs> I'm not going. Hi, not going, I'm John. Fuck! up in community news this week we were thrilled to get a first look at fred moreau's new kickstarter project a line of shock treatment pins buttons and stickers this kickstarter just launched on monday september 27th with a goal of creating a shocky pin series to be released in time for rko4 which for those of you keeping track is only 11 months away I I don't know what noise that was. I got a little too excited. I'm sorry. For his seventh project, Fred is working with the amazingly talented Harley Bean to create this new line. So the way these Kickstarter projects work is when the project raises a certain amount of money, another pin design gets unlocked and becomes purchasable, either separately or as part of the bundle that you back. 
when the project hits its first goal of $250, which it has as of recording time on Tuesday the 28th, we, the avid consumers, are able to purchase a design featuring Brad with a very 70s blender with the words, oh, blender. If the project hits the $500 mark, as of recording, it's only $25 away from reaching, a Farley Flavors design unlocks, featuring the man himself in his white suit with the Ace of Hearts, because what are we looking at? You're looking at an ace. That's right. <laughs> Lastly, if this project is able to raise $750, we unlock Bert Schnick, creepily standing behind the double M marriage maze sign. So this is all the info we've got for the project up to now. And oh man, we absolutely cannot wait for more. I'm personally a huge shock treatment fan. And as far as I'm concerned, there is a severe lack of good shock treatment merch out there for the community i'm beyond excited that we're about to get some more especially since it'll be coming from two of the hardest working and most talented members of our wonderful community yeah many thanks to harley and fred we're going to keep our listeners notified as the project progresses on kickstarter as of right now we're less than 24 hours in and the project has already raised 478 dollars do you guys think we'll unlock our birth design Dude, I, I've got a sneaking suspicion that we just might. We've linked to the Kickstarter page in our show notes. If you want to check out the project and maybe sign up to be a backer, which we cannot recommend enough, you can head there to see all the cool designs. Next up in community news, uh, guys. So this is a Rocky Horror community podcast, and nothing is more relevant to the Rocky Horror community everywhere than the age-old question that we all see time and time again everywhere in every Facebook group, blog post, and Reddit thread online, especially around October. Hi, I live in downtown LA. Are there any Rocky Horror shows in my area? Howdy, y'all. I live 38 miles away from the nearest Sunuco gas station grocery store. I want to take my little ones to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show this Halloween. Y'all know any performances happening around my neck of the woods? Hi, I, I'm me, Aaron, Aaron and I've, I've been on a Rocky cast for 15 years. My job sent me away for the weekend, and, and I want to ditch co-worker happy hour on Friday night and hang out with cool Rocky people instead. Which casts are performing in the Toledo area tomorrow night? We all see these questions all the time, and we all ask the same questions all the time. In the year of our Lord 2021, there's got to be a better way. Well, now there is, Nikki. You see, a couple years ago, I started RHPSnews.com, a news site dedicated to Rocky Horror News. Hey, why does that sound so familiar? Maybe because you and Meg use it every single week to write the show? Oh yeah, that's why. Seriously though, it's a great site. We pull a lot of our global news segments from articles that get published to RHPS News every week, but most weeks we only choose the ones that will be most entertaining to talk about because we can't talk about everything, obviously. Um, there are plenty of weeks where there's lots of cool stuff published to the site that we don't even have the time to get to. If you're someone who really likes our global news segment in particular, you really like the content on the site. Yeah, I mean, this was just a little project that I was messing around with for myself uh, about three years ago uh, is when I started on it. Um, I just wanted to screw around with the Google Alerts service that they offer where you can like just put in some keywords and you'll get n alerts sent to you whenever anything that Google finds out on the internet matches the stuff that you searched for. Um, however, you can have this come to you in a like a news feed that's like this XML feed and you can have it continuously come to you and you can create an unlimited amount of them. So I created alerts for every single Rocky Horror actor and Rocky Horror, Rocky Horror Show, Rocky Horror Picture, all the variations on that garbage, fed it all through an application that I wrote and uh, I go through and manually curate it uh, over the week. I just sit there and scroll through 
hundreds of articles and click no, 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 no. Ooh, that one. Uh, and yeah, it's been serving us really well for the last couple of years, but um, especially now after the Panera Bread has uh, kind of been winding down, lots of people are trying to get back out and see some shows and they don't really know where all those shows are. And well, I see all those announcements. If you're a member of a cast and your cast posts their shows on Eventbrite or you make newspaper article posts or any of that kind of stuff, if, if you guys have an online presence that isn't just on social media, uh, that stuff shows up in the feed and that's what I see. And that's what this new section that I've been creating is all about. So we've got a bit of a call to action for all our listeners. If you're a part of a Rocky Horror Shadowcast or you know of any upcoming Rocky Horror performances anywhere, we would love if you'd submit them to be published on the site. That way, anyone looking for a show in that area will be able to search on the site to find it. Yeah, so if uh, you already are promoting your show out there on uh, some other platform that's not social media, probably have picked it up, but if you're not, go check out the website. It's rhpsnews.com. There'll be a link on there to submit your show. Just click on that, fill out the form, and boom, I will curate it when I get the chance, and it'll get posted up there. All the information you need is right there, and it'll show up in a special section that is manually curated specifically for the shadow casting community that is more prevalent than all of the big giant lists of events that come out uh, because literally right now I'm posting every single one of them that comes through, whether it's a stage show performance in a small town or just a random one-off Halloween screening at a drive-in or a bar or a trivia night. Uh, there's several hundred of them posted up already and that's just for the month of October. If you guys are wondering, is Rocky out there? Are there tons of shows happening right now? Absolutely yes. The answer is unequivocally there are hundreds of shows happening. And you too can submit your cast to be shown big up on bright lights at the top of the page and where everybody can see it and get some more people to take a look and come out to your show. We know lots of you have upcoming performances. We see them all over social media and we can't wait to receive all your submissions and help you spread the word about your shows. And while we're on the subject, if you've got a piece of community news you'd like to share on our podcast, we know you've got lots of that coming up too. Maybe it's a cool story for Big Dick Storytime about a neat venue you're getting to perform at for Halloween, or just a fun little tale about something awesome you've done during your time on a cast. Or maybe it's a really bomb Rocky-related project you're working on and want to tell the whole community about it. If you want to share with the class, just go to our website, rockytalkypodcast.com and fill out our form, and we'll include it in our next episode. We love you all, and we cannot wait to hear from you. And with that, let's get snacky, you guys. Mmm, <laughs> snacks. <Okay. laughs> yes, gentlemen. Are you guys ready? Are we excited? We all know what time it is. It's snack time. Well... Actually, Jacob, I was going to say that it's finally October, the spooky season. Time for the rest of the non-Rocky-obsessed world to pull their fishnets out of the closet, Google their local showing, load up on three bottles of wine, and loudly exclaim all night about how they are just the biggest Rocky horror fan. After all, they saw it like 20 times in their junior year of high school in 1984. That feels oddly specific. Well... Actually, Aaron, it's not even true. We totally got you. <laughs> it's totally just some words that I made up. I concocted it all and put it in Nikki's mouth, and she got you with her mouth words. Um, phrasing. I did it to prove a point, to take you down a peg. I'm sick of you every week with your facts that you cite from your books. You can't trust everything you hear or that you read, Aaron. And you especially can't trust your incredibly loaded up aunt who said she was going to make sure you got to sit in the front row at your first Rocky show, but instead left you at concessions while she flirted with that guy who she said was Tim Curry, but was actually just a creepy clown who owned a van that had a modest mouse CD stuck in its stereo and would play float on on a loop. Uh, again, that that was oddly specific. Ah! 
I made it up again. I got you. That wasn't a fact at all. I don't I don't know what we're doing. Nikki, can you please regain control of your segment? No, no. I think Jacob is onto something. We've all met that asshole, Jacob. You know, the one who is totally the authority about everything, including Rocky Horror, who knows tons of cool facts, but you aren't quite sure if they're true or just urban legends or pulled out of thin air. Or they're thin ass. Or maybe they aren't an asshole. Maybe they're just a good-intentioned friend of yours that is on a cast, and they heard this thing one time, and they wanted you to know this super cool fact about Rocky Horror, but they can't quite remember where they learned about it. Okay, okay, I I think I see where this is going. You guys want to know about how someone like me fact-checks all those cool little facts that float around in the Rocky community. I got you. Well, actually, Aaron, no, we don't. No, not at all. This is not Aaron talks about all the books he reads. These are some itty-bitty knack snacks. What we want to do is throw down on some of these super cool facts that we've all heard. Be it from that friend on cast, my drunk aunt, or that asshole who owns all the Rocky books on this planet, Shmarin. And we want you to tell us what the real story is. We want to be the ones who can say, well, actually, you're right. And did you know... We want to be that asshole, except we want the ammunition to know we've got all the facts straight. So I made a list. These are the things that we've heard, be it online or online at a Rocky show, or at the bar afterwards, or backstage, or in a random Halloween article in the paper, whatever. All our listeners have probably heard them before. Maybe they've even repeated them. We want to run them down, and you can be just like Snopes. Snopes? It, it's a, a fact-checking website. They're the ones that will tell you, no, Walt Disney did not get cryogenically frozen. He was cremated and interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. And it will cite all of its, like, reputable sources, and it'll break down the myth, and it'll assure you, like, once and for all that Walt Disney was not frozen. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> But yeah, I get it. Whatever. We all know they cremated Disney's body. It's his head that's hanging out in a big glass jar along with all the other celebrities. Uh, okay, no. Walt Disney's head was never shown on Futurama. I checked the official Futurama wiki. Uh, Walter Cronkite, Walter Mondale. N- no, Walt Disney. See? Yes! This is what we are looking for. Yes, give me the fact juice. This yummy, yummy fact juice. Slurp it up my fucking mouth. Nah, nah. No juice. What did you say about my people? Juice, Jacob. You said juice. Nothing pulpy, please. Just facts. I I get it. You got it. Let's let's do this. No, no. You can't do that. I want to talk about Jews. And I can. Because I am one of the chosen people. I mean, it wasn't the first one on this list. But sure, Jacob. Let's talk about Jews. Right. What's the deal with that stupid pink triangle on Frank's lab scene jacket? Listen, I know, I know. Aaron, you have told us time and time again that it isn't a reference to the Holocaust. You have also said that it wasn't intended to be a reference to gay pride or to anything. It was just a coincidence. But why the fuck do I still see it coming up over and over again all over the place? I do see that one a lot. And I always try to correct it whenever someone tries to tell the story wrong. But it's just a rumor that won't go away. And I promise, guys, this is the last time we'll talk about it. I know we've done some light summaries on it before, and you're all probably just as sick of hearing about it as we are. We wouldn't have to keep bringing it up if people would just stop repeating it. It's honestly, though, not surprising that it won't go away. If you Google Rocky Horror Frank Pink Triangle... You're going to get over 200,000 results, many of which are repeating that same story. And the especially unfortunate thing is a lot of them are actually citing Rocky Horror books that I even have on my shelf. This big lie has been so often repeated over the years that several authors have printed it as common knowledge fact, meaning they haven't even bothered to cite a source. 
However, this is a relatively straightforward false equivalence fallacy. A what now? A logical fallacy. An incorrect similarity based on an oversimplification of the comparison or ignorance of additional factors. Exactly. Oh, so like comparing apples to oranges. Precisely. Because here, here are the facts. It is true that a pink triangle was worn by homosexuals in concentration camps during the Holocaust, but it was generally worn upside down. It is also true that the pink triangle has been a widely used symbol for gay culture since the mid-70s. In 1972, a Hamburg publishing house released the first autobiography of a gay concentration camp survivor. The title of the book was The Men with the Pink Triangle, and its cover used a large downward-facing pink triangle. The symbol was later reclaimed by the gay community as a symbol of empowerment. Most notably, in 1987, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP, used the symbol with the slogan, Silence Equals Death. Right. We've talked about that before, and I've seen it on Wikipedia. But if I look on the pink triangle Wikipedia page, it also says, literally in the same paragraph that talks about ACT UP, that, quote, in the 1975 movie, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, Dr. Frank Furter, a bisexual transvestite, wears a pink triangle badge on one of his outfits. And it cites a source. But don't you see it, Nikki? This is the false equivalency. It is true that it was used by the Nazis. It is true that it became a symbol of the gay rights movement. And it is true that Frank wears a triangle on his lab scene gown. All of those facts are true, and they all talk about a pink triangle. But just because they're about similar things does not mean that they are inherently related. Also, just for reference, go take a hard look at Frank's lab scene gown in the film. It's not pink, it's red. And it's not upside down, it's right side up. Well, fuck. I hate to say it, but you're right. And also, this citation from Wikipedia is some random article on Medium.com. But oh, wait, it does cite a source. It cites an academic paper by Sean Soman from 2014. Um, but I can't seem to find that. (laughs) That's because the Medium article got it wrong. It wasn't published in 2014. Sean Soman published his article in 2016 in a journal called Film Matters and is titled... Frankenfurter, or the modern gothic, adapted subversion in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I can't find that either. It's from some academic journal. Oh, don't worry. I paid the 15 bucks that I had to to get access to the four-page article. Academic paywalls are bullshit. I totally agree. I certainly wouldn't check our show notes for a potential link to screenshots that someone may have uploaded anonymously online. Nope, wouldn't do that. But... Guess what? You look through that journal article, and surprise, there is nothing that can be used as a citation. Sean Soman doesn't even pretend to offer proof that the triangle on Frank's lab coat is an intentional reference to the Holocaust. Instead, he chooses to cite a source that simply says that pink triangles were used by the Nazis. No connection, just false equivalence. But okay. So a Medium article quoted a scholarly journal, and that journal didn't present a proper citation. Just a false equivalence. But that can't be the only reason that this keeps getting repeated all over the place. Unfortunately, it's not. And sadly, the true reason has to do with several published books. Not a random academic paper. And in fact, it's not just a single book. It's in several books. And those books, in combination with a litany of other academic papers, blog articles, top 10 lists, YouTube videos, podcasts, what have you, they all erroneously repeated this falsity, and it has completely saturated the internet, and as we saw, it's even contaminated Wikipedia. The most sacred of texts. You joke, but... But mostly... I place the blame on the published books, as those are what the most of the most diehard of Rocky Horror fans will have read, and it's because of those books that some totally obsessed Rocky fan may have repeated this inaccuracy. Hell, I know I am even guilty of telling this one many years ago before I dug into it properly. Don't get me wrong, 
the books we're about to talk about are on a whole very well done works they just get this one fact horribly horribly wrong more frustratingly in my opinion is that one of those books that gets it very wrong purports to be a scholarly attempt at analyzing rocky horror and as such it is one of the most cited references in other works that talk about the pink triangle and somehow this book manages to mangle the facts even worse than all others combined. That book is Cultographies, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, written by Jeffrey Weinstock and published in 2007. It is the first book published by Weinstock on Rocky Horror. His second published book about Rocky being Reading Rocky Horror, The Rocky Horror Picture Show and Popular Culture, one where he served as an editor, and which we've used before. Specifically, in our episode, Be Just and Fear Not, about how, well, it's a weird one. Go listen if you haven't been keeping up. Right. His first book, though, Cultographies, is a relatively ambitious attempt at approaching Rocky from an academic angle. However, his first chapter makes a number of extremely dubious connections between Rocky Horror and the Nazis, supported by little more than conjecture and false equivalents. There are plenty of citations taken from World War II history and from 70s and 80s gay culture, but what he failed to find was a single citation giving context from Richard O'Brien, Jim Sharman, Brian Thompson, Sue Blaine, or anyone else who had a hand in actually creating the stage show or the film. And yet, with absolutely no supporting evidence, Weinstock uses the pink triangle as one of his three tenets supporting his entire argument for the introductory chapter of his scholarly book. He suffered the same mistake that Sorman made earlier in his academic piece. He knew about the use of the triangle in Nazi Germany, and he knew about it as a symbol for gay culture, and he just assumed that there was a connection. And unfortunately, given the severity of this mistake, it forces the reader to turn a critical eye to all of the other theories that he puts forward in the rest of the book, some of which I even think might actually have merit. But let's not be too harsh on Weinstock. You said there were more books that made the same mistake about the pink triangle? Th that's right. In Marissa C. Hayes' fan phenomena, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, she too repeatedly references the pink triangle on Frank's lab coat and incorrectly states it as a reference to Nazi concentration camps. Not once, not twice, but on three separate occasions, with nary a citation to be found either. And there are still more, even when the theory is couched in skepticism Simply repeating it lends it credence. Just look at the way modern conservative entertainment news operates. In Still the Beast is Feeding, authors Rob Bagnall and Phil Barden do undoubtedly mention the debate about the meaning of the triangle and the potential link to the Holocaust. However, unlike Weinstock and Hayes, they have the good sense to mention that A. The triangle is red not pink, in the original stage show and movie, and B, the triangle faces upward, not downward, and C, that Sue Blaine has denied being aware of the connection. I mean, good. That's all good. But I get the sense that you're still pretty miffed about this one, Aaron. With all these sources out there talking about it, many of which we ourselves have used as citations on this very podcast, what else is there? I feel like you've been slow rolling the payoff here. So let me just tee this up for you. Some asshole comes up to you and says, <clears throat> some asshole, that's your cue. Oh, uh, uh, hey, Aaron. Did you hear that the pink triangle on, on Frank's lab coat is a reference to the Holocaust? And you say, <clears throat> well, actually, Jacob, it's not. You see, in the original stage production, Sue Blaine was working on an extremely small budget. But one thing she could afford was to go to a hospital and buy some old gowns. In particular, she went to the Hammersmith Medical School and from a Mr. S. Lozar acquired surgical gowns, gloves, and masks. And more to the point, those gowns that Sue Blaine acquired already had the triangles on them. The triangles were red. They faced upwards and were completely genuine for surgery. 
The reason many believe they are pink is that over the years, as the costumes were washed, the red colored triangles faded and became pink. It was entirely unintentional, and if Sue Blaine had known the significance of the symbol, she would have never used it. Okay, wow. But, see, Aaron, this is the problem we were talking about. I didn't hear a citation in there. Yeah, bruh. Put up or shut up. <laughs> no problem. Here's the citation. And for all of our listeners out there, this is why you can be absolutely certain that this is accurate. The source for the gowns, being from the Hammersmith Medical School, is from the original Rocky Horror Playbill from the first run at the theater upstairs. In a Grateful Thanks To section on the inside right page, they are explicitly thanked for providing the gowns. This program from the June 1973 production is published courtesy of Tony Pazuzu and Mark Jabara on OzRockyHorror.com. It's in the Playbills section. Go check it out. Okay, but... Furthermore, everything else about the triangle already being on the gowns and the color fading due to the repeat washing is directly from an interview with Sue Blaine. Oh, snap, bitches! Even better, it is an unedited interview with Sue Blaine, published in Rocky Horror from Concept to Cult by Scott Michaels and David Evans. These are her words, only very slightly paraphrased by me. Absolutely nothing has been added or modified. If you want to read them for yourself, it's on pages 105 and 106. Well, holy shit, man. Mike fucking dropped. Thank you. Riddle me this, though. Does the UK stage show still use a pink triangle? <laughs> so, ironically, they actually changed it many years back. Uh, in the early 2000s, the triangle was removed entirely, and since at least 2014, all the way up to the current UK stage show run with Stephen Webb playing Frankenfurter, the triangle has been replaced instead with a pink heart. Ha! Huh. Which probably actually lends more credence to the stories. You know how those crazy conspiracy theorists think. I, I did say it was kind of ironic. But still, glad to see it updated. That heart is cute. There's photos on the UK Time Warp fan site if you want to check it out for yourself. All right. I regret steering us off into that massive, massive tangent. This was supposed to be a bunch of fun little facts so that we could all be the smartest guys in the room. Maybe we do a couple little ones, perhaps some that are true, please? A few more little knack snacks? Yeah, sure. I'm game. Here's a good one. I've always been curious about this one. I think we all know that the skeleton in the clock is real. You mean Norm MacDonald? Fuck, man. Poor Yafid. Is that a Norville reference? Yeah, he voiced the big green slug monster that, you know, fucked the doctor. I am just going to move past that. <laughs> so the skeleton in the clock, it's real. But like, what is it? Who is it? Why did someone put a skeleton in a clock in the first place? So many unanswered questions. Perfect. This one is actually super straightforward. It's a trap. It is real, isn't it? The skeleton? Uh, by all accounts, yes. So, the clock. When they were preparing to film Rocky, the production team took a trip down to Bray Studios to check out what Brian Thompson called the Old Hammer House. Uh, you guys probably know it as Oakley Court. It's a hotel. I've stayed there. Right. So after they saw Oakley Court, Brian Thompson was offered to take a look at the Hammer Warehouse. He jumped at the opportunity, thinking that there would be a ton of stuff to raid, seeing as all the old Hammer films had a ton of mad scientist lab equipment and all sorts of other things. That's where stuff like the tank comes from. It was used in a few Hammer horror movies before Rocky, particularly the 1958 movie, The Revenge of Frankenstein. But Brian Thompson ended up being pretty disappointed. The warehouse was just a shed behind the building at Bray Studios that's just down the road from Oakley Court, where many of the interior scenes for Rocky were shot. Much of the credit, Brian Thompson said, for the items that were found for the sets goes instead to Ian Whitaker. He was the set dresser on the film. He's the one that found, for example, all the taxidermy animals, and he is credited as the guy who thought to write Magenta's shopping list on the lab wall next to the transducer, and he's the one who came across the famous clock. According to Terry Aikland Snow, he was the art director for Rocky, the clock itself was found 
inside Oakley Court. Okay. So, at some point after the clock was used in Rocky, it was acquired by Ken Paul's London Theatrical Prop Company. And in 2002, Sotheby's auctioned off the contents of the company. Much of what we believe we know about the clock comes from the auction description provided by Sotheby's. Itself, quoting from Ken Paul's daughter when they spoke with her in preparation for the auction. And all that other stuff about where they found it? Just because you made such a big deal about sources. All that comes from Concepts to Cult. You know, where the Sue Blaine interview comes from? These are direct quotes from Brian Thompson and Terry Ackland Snow. The information about the clock from the Ken Paul Company, as mentioned, comes from his daughter. Very nice. So one paragraph of the Sotheby's announcement reads as follows. The ultimate conversation piece has to be the mystery clock in a full-sized inlaid mahogany coffin, dated circa 1900, complete with real skeleton, used in the opening scenes of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The skeleton is rumored to be the remains of the young Italian lover and secretary of the Countess of Rosslyn. After his death, she couldn't bear to be separated from him, so she immortalized him in the clock and took him everywhere with her. According to the provenance, the clock had been acquired by Ken Paul from an unnamed music hall escape artist. When it sold at auction in 2002, the clock was won by an anonymous bidder for 35,000 pounds. 35,000 pounds. Jesus. I mean, it's a cool clock, but I don't know about that. However... And I hate to do this to you guys. The story of the clock may be a bit of, I don't know, let's say creative wishful thinking. No, not again, please. So this comes from a 2011 magazine article about the Rosslyn Bones, a minor archaeological oddity that made headlines a decade ago due to the bones being found in the Rosslyn Chapel, which itself was made famous for being featured in The Da Vinci Code. In it, the author provides some skepticism about the story. At the time that the clock was purported to have been made, the Countess of Rosalind would have been married to the fourth Earl from 1866 until his death in 1890. Her own death was in 1933. Presumably, it's then that the clock would have then been sold to the escapologist. So it's unclear when the Ken Paul Theatre Company acquired the clock. Perhaps it lingered at Oakley Court for several years while belonging to the escapologist and was later acquired. Perhaps it was borrowed from the Ken Paul Company for one of the many Hammer films. We haven't found documentation either way as to when the Ken Paul Company came into its possession, but by the late 90s, it was certainly owned by the Ken Paul Theatre Company. And the last film that we were able to place it in after its use in Rocky is the 2001 Johnny Depp film about Jack the Ripper, From Hell. So, is the skeleton real? That I would confidently say yes to. Sotheby certainly had to represent it accurately for their auction in 2002. Is it the remains of the Italian lover of the Countess of Rosslyn? That part, I think, is up for debate. Woo, it's a real skeleton. That's awesome. Also, and I feel this is worth mentioning, that article you cited about the Rosslyn Bones... It contains some seriously unacademic conspiracy theory Freemasons kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely take that author's opinions with a, a grain of salt. All right, all right. I think I can live with that. Certainly more info than I started with. We got time for one more? Yeah, I think we can do one more if you, you know, if you make it short. All right. So, what's the deal with the castle special effects at the end of the movie? They are, like, super crappy. Like, like not just budget sci-fi movie crappy. Like, really, really bad. Oh, I know this one. It's really bad because it's really cheap. <laughs> and yeah, it's bad. Originally, Brian Thompson wanted to make a full-scale model of the castle and have it blast off, all done with, like, a suitable, amazing miniature special effect. But Rocky had a micro budget, so he had to settle for, well, the last best thing. (laughs) It's literally a cutout picture of the castle, and someone is just raising the picture out of the frame. Wait, really? And they just 
blew all that smoke behind the picture? The smoke is an attempt to cover up the real Oakley Court, which you can totally see behind the picture, still just sitting there, before it cuts to superheroes. The photo gets pulled off screen. Oops, there's the castle still sitting there. Boom. Done. Those cheap bastards! Cheap bastards indeed. Recycling hospital gowns, finding set pieces lying around, ones that contain a literal dead guy, and special effects that any six-year-old with a cell phone could outproduce. Oh, Rocky, it's okay. We know you're cheap, just like us. We still love you. And that's our show. If anyone has a question they'd like us to answer on air for Nikki Asks a Question, or some community news they'd like us to talk about, or even a cool story to share with the community, we'd love to include it in our show. Just go to our website, rockytalkypodcast.com, and fill out our contact form to tell us about it. If you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It makes the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps us grow the show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. We'll talk to you all next week. Bye! Bye! See ya! Hey, where the fuck is John? Dead. Mm. Yeah, where is John? Dead. Working. Fired. I blackmailed him to get his episode this week. Mm. It's September 28th, and it feels wildly dishonest to say that it's October. You know, silent This protest. airs in October. But right now, it's not. So we're lying to our customers, and they'll get us back for this one. The show is free. And they will... Judge us for that too, yeah.